noise. Wait, can you say bring the noise or is that like, let's get ready to rumble? Um, I mean, it's from a song. Right. But can like, has Dre trademarked it? Bring the noise. I don't know. Probably. He's a, he's got enough money to do it now. Turn it up. Turn it up. Well, he should. We should all uh, put intellectual property shackles on everything we can think of. Don't you think? Everything's got to be political with you. <laughs> Democrats walk like this. Republicans <laughs> walk like this. <laughs> all right. I am not going to use the FSL template today hey, to move. try to record <laughs> Uh, DTNS, and then frighten myself when I don't see the wave in the proper folder. All right, you ready to do this? Yep. Here we go. When having tea with the queen, you must remember three important things. One, pinky up. Two, never wear a hat more audacious than hers. And three, make sure you wear your DTNS t-shirt. To become queen appropriate, go to dailytechnewsshow.com forward slash support. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, July 9th, 2015. I am Tom Merritt. Thank you for having me in your ears or possibly even your eyes today. Joining me, Justin Robert Young, DTNS contributor and podcaster. I don't think extraordinaire is a big enough word to describe you, Justin. Oh, man. Well, I like to think of myself as just a simple podcaster doing the best with his two hands. Yeah, that's why they call you Justin Two Hands. Yeah, well, because a lot of times podcasters, uh, you know, they try to go one-handed. Uh, a mistake in my book. Hey, I read in Wired today that podcasting is back. Is it? I mean, the, there's a con- there's more conventions now. I, I think I've I've seen more podcasting conventions. In the there last, was a like, false days. start in the early 2000s, apparently, and we were given a 20-yard penalty. And so yeah. we now had to recover from that. But I think I think you want to know what uh, I'm. I'm actually already getting excited for the next time podcasting. <laughs> the next time podcasting. Me too. Me too. I'm curious. Like, okay, we've done serial. We've done ESPN. We've done comedians. What's next? It's exciting. Yeah. Uh, who knows? But Maybe we should do tech news. We we probably should stick to what we know. Let's do that. Here we go. Headlines. Recode reports Facebook announced a new option in its newsfeed preference that allows users to pick up to 30 people or pages that will automatically appear at the top of their newsfeed, colloquially being called see first, your see first list. Facebook won't use the list to target ads, they say. Uh, according to newsfeed product manager Greg Mara, that's not going to happen. The new option should become available on iOS as an update to the app later today, and if it's not there already for you, uh, and Android and the web versions of Facebook will get it later. Not sure exactly when. This has sparked our discussion topic for later, though. We've got plenty to talk about, but the idea of algorithm plus human is now officially in vogue. So free your mind and the rest will follow. Strike a pose. The Verge reports a Microsoft Office 2016 for Mac has launched. Mac users get features like sandboxed apps, full screen view, and retina screen optimization. It also integrates OneDrive cloud storage, adds co-authoring support, and supports traditional Windows shortcuts for Office so users can use Control-Shift instead of Command-Shift. Office 2016 for Mac ships with five apps. Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, and OneNote is available to Office 365 Home and personal subscribers today. The standalone version will be released in September. I'll tell you the one thing about this release as an Office for Mac user that I am fixated on is that control shift thing. So the curmudgeon part of me says... Well, that's just non-standard. It's command for everything in, yeah. in, in OS X. And a, as a dual user, I know when I'm at my Windows machine to use control and when I'm at a Mac to use command. And you're confusing things because sometimes I'll be able to use control now and others not. However, there is kind of a state-dependent memory with Office where when I'm in Office, I will more often make the mistake of trying to use control when I'm in OS X just because I'm used to it. Uh, and then that would make it not be a problem anymore. 
But you want to know what? It kind of feels like Microsoft sort of just bringing what people like about Microsoft and identify as part of the positive element of their brand, which is you can have customization. We give you more granular options so you can make your experience your own, and bringing that to Mac is really rad. Tom, if only there was a catchphrase that invoked a professional wrestler to describe positive micro. Yeah, it's, if Satyamania was running wild everywhere, uh, it's not. It's not real. It's not real wild in Finland right now. I'm just saying. No. But everywhere else. <laughs> Well, no, it ran wild with their jobs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, too soon. Oh. Uh, not even, that didn't even happen yet. IBM and partners like Global Foundries and Samsung have produced the first seven nanometer chips with functional transistors. Ars Technica has a good report, a good write-up on this. Uh, this is a huge deal. It may be a little hard to wrap your head around, but the test chip was built at the IBM SUNY Polytechnic 300 millimeter research facility in Albany, New York. Uses FinFET transistors that have silicon germanium channels instead of the traditional silicon only, created using self-aligned quadruple patterning and extreme ultraviolet lithography or EUV. Now, if you don't understand any of those words, hang in here. The reason silicon germanium is good is that it has a higher electron mobility, and that means it can overcome the silicon's resistance to smaller channels. It just means you can make it smaller if you can make germanium work. EUV lithography makes etching the smaller transistors possible because an EUV uh, light beam is 13.5 nanometers wavelength compared to the argon fluoride laser they use now, which is 193. And even if you don't know what those numbers mean, you know that 193 is much bigger than 13.5. EUV is expensive to deploy commercially, so it does remain to be seen how IBM has made this viable, but they think they have. And IBM says a commercial chip using the process could be as few as two years away, although it might be a little longer. I bet it's going to be longer. Uh, this is a big, big, big deal because it says, hey, you know what? Moore's Law might get another refresh. It may kick, be kicked down the road a little bit more. Uh, people were thinking 10 nanometers might be as far as we could get. Life finds a way, Tom. It, it always does when it comes to Moore's Law over the last uh, you know, couple decades. And, and I'm excited to see it happening... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm excited to see this happening in uh, in 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 Albany. You know, uh, Albany, uh, upstate New York uh, has uh, specifically Albany with Kodak has had a, a rich history of technological advancement over the last hundred years. Great point. Nine to five, Google's Stephen Hall has been talking to several sources familiar with advanced prototypes of the next version of Google Glass, the so-called Enterprise Edition will have a larger prism display, an atom processor, and improved battery life. Hall says his source back, uh, uh, back up the FCC filing that showed a potential Google Glass successor working on the 5 gig Wi-Fi band as well. Announcements of the death of Google Glass have been greatly exaggerated. I've been saying this. Or have they? For months. I mean, do right, uh, you think it is telling that they're calling this the Enterprise Edition, that this might be more well, uh, fleet. The Enterprise Edition has never gone out of service. They actually continue to support that one, the current, and, and the one that they, the, the original version that yes. went out in the Enterprise. So, so no, I, I, I think this means they, they realize one of the places where this is working out better. And, and that's, I guess that, that's my point, is that the consumer Google Glass is dead. Maybe. Mm, probably. The next web reports Slack has added emoji voting to its communication platform. Users can choose to add a reaction to their post uh, or the posts of others by selecting an emoji or more than one emoji. Afterwards, then other users can add their own emoji or just click on one that has been added. So in other words, you can make a poll, for instance, where people are asked to vote puppy face or fish flag uh, for their different options. Mathematically speaking, the multiplier effect here means that Slack times emoji equals peak tech hipster. <laughs> well, all right. So Slack is something that just popped up overnight and is now dominant. Like in terms of, and maybe it is just my thin layer of life. But IRC is dead. 
Well, I, I mean, who knows if it's dead? All I know is that this product, a very specific uh, 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 connection of a lot of very available tech behind a wall and, and with an element of privacy to it, has become gigantic. And the only way they stay there is if they keep adding every little possible thing that you could want to make your conversations more interesting. I have no idea if anybody's going to vote with an emoji past today. Uh, but it would have been very, very fun if people worked the uh, DeAndre Jordan uh, emoji battle that uh, <laughs> unfolded uh, yesterday across sports blogs into a uh, Slack uh, conversation. I think that would I have, have been... I have to give Slack this much. They know their audience. Emojis are going to get the Slack base really fired up. And they're good at this. Like, I was yeah. like, really? You did emojis in a poll? Like, well, let's see how this works. It works great. And that's why people are so excited about Slack. And I'm a Slack user. You know, I'm making fun of myself here when I call it a tech hipster thing uh, because it, it works really well. That's why people I mean, I mean, two Slack communities, and there were uh, multiple polls in both with emojis on day one. So you're right. They know their audience. Reuters reports China's parliament published a draft cybersecurity law that increases privacy protection as well as government authority to obtain records and block dissemination of private information. ISPs must store, keep data collected within China, stored in the country. Uh, overseas data storage will require government approval. Network equipment must also get government approval. And parliament will gather feedback on the proposal unit until early August. Uh, yeah, so this is something you probably you may have heard people complaining about. Uh, it was supposedly voted on Monday, but it was finally published on Wednesday. And a lot of companies around the world are very skeptical about the vague wording of this law and what it might mean, especially regarding where you are allowed to store particular types of data. So it'll be interesting to see how this all shakes out. I mean, as as with anything in terms of a top-down Chinese solution, it feels very malleable to whoever is in power that wants to enforce certain elements of it. Nothing can really be too rigid or too porous because uh, when you have an authoritarian culture like, like China has, it, it really depends on who is stamping the paper that gets to decide what is and what isn't going to happen. Uh, just to note, a nail in the Nook platform, TechCrunch reports that Barnes & Noble is closing its international Nook app for Windows. Nook users outside the U.S. and U.K. will have their content removed from Windows machines and may be eligible for a refund if they purchased books using their Microsoft account as a payment method. Barnes & Noble bought out Microsoft's investment in the Nook store last December. Uh, here's what happens, folks, when you buy DRM material and then that business changes. It's not even going out of business. They're just saying, oh, that agreement changed, so those books, yeah, you don't own those anymore. Doesn't it kind of feel like sort of the winter of the, 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 the harvest that bloomed maybe five or six years ago? Like we had the news about the Windows phone yesterday. You have the Nook today. Just It kind of feels like yeah. we, 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 we have our winners in, in, these, in, in a lot of these races, and now some of the also-rans are... are kind of fading into the darkness. It's a reaping. It is. The it cannons is. are going off and the faces of the Nook and Lumias are showing in the sky. VentureBeat reports T-Mobile USA is extending its unlimited roaming to cover Mexico and Canada. T-Mobile allows free roaming to more than 120 countries. CEO John Legere uh, also told journalists on a conference call Thursday that the carrier added 2.1 million customers last quarter, bringing its total to 80 or sorry, 58.9 million, passing Sprint to become the number three carrier in the United States. We are number three. We are number three, say the T-Mobile USA employees. Uh, you know, T-Mobile was written off. It was going to be sold to AT&T. It was done. It was over. Uh, and now it's risen to number three. At what point does Deutsche Telekom look at this and say, huh, maybe we don't sell T-Mobile USA off after all? Or does it become a more troubling asset to sell off considering its market share? You know, at, at this point, you know, it, it, it can't go. Uh, I mean, obviously, AT&T already tried and it was too big to swallow for the, uh, for the regulators. Uh, but 
now it, it's it's kind of so it, it the bigger it gets, the more problematic it would become to be a, a, an acquisition target for a lot of different uh, a lot of different other companies. Yeah, it's passing through that dangerous ground of like, okay, well you better keep growing and become worth owning, <laughs> yeah, or else you're not worth selling either. That's an interesting point. Reuters reports the U.S. Office of Personnel Management said Thursday that attackers accessed information for about 21.5 million people from background investigation databases. That includes 1.8 million non-applicants, mostly spouses, cohabitants, etc. Uh, this, if you're like, wait a minute, didn't I already hear about that? This is in addition to the information about 4.2 million current and former federal workers that was accessed in a separate but related incident. Oof. That's all I got to say. Yeah. Yeah. Time for some news from you. That'll cheer us up. Uh, thanks to everybody who submits articles, votes on articles at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Big thanks to our moderators who keep it running smoothly. Uh, you guys are the best. And many of the stories you've heard already on this show were submitted on the subreddit. Another one that was submitted was from Flobama, posted a link to the Google Store for an accessory that adds an Ethernet port to the Chromecast. Ars Technica reports that if a power, that it's a, essentially a power brick that plugs into the Chromecast USB port and provides both power and Ethernet connectivity at 100 megabits per second. The adapter cost $15 on the Google Store when it was available in the U.S., but it already sold out. So you can't get uh, one there right now. Solves the two of the biggest sort of real-world problems when you get a Chromecast and you're really excited about it and you realize, oh, wait, my TV is not new enough for it to get power uh, via the, the television itself, and m maybe my, my big strip where I have everything else plugged in for my media center is too full to have something else plug into it. So uh, this is great, and, you know, the, the Wi-Fi element of, uh, of, of, of the Chromecast is something that is kind of troublesome and oftentimes kind of uh, dampen, dampens the experience a little bit. That, that's a great add-on. Yeah, if you're at the edge of acceptable bandwidth for the Chromecast, Wi-Fi is going to be more of an issue. The lag that is in, involved there is going to crop up more often, and so you're going to want to hardwire this, and this allows you to do it. No wonder it's sold out so quick. And CROD2 sent us the extreme tech report that the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology has a plan to clean up its own cube sats after their useful life is over. Clean Space One is satellite uh, with a sensor and a canonical net that can close around a 10 centimeter CubeSat satellite, much in the way that Pac Man eats dots. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this. <laughs> Sorry about that. Damn. Okay. My, just, Pandora's stop. box of sound. I'll, I'll stop playing with the tablet. The CubeSat is then secured and dragged down into the atmosphere. While it's not a solution for larger space junk, Clean Space One is at least consistent with a growing leave no trace in space philosophy. Diamond Club does hope you enjoy this program. <laughs> I hope you enjoy that headline. Uh, okay, apologies for that. However, pretty cool. This is cleaning up after yourself. This is essentially the satellite version of pack it in, pack it out. I'm putting up a CubeSat. But I've also got another sat that will go and it will grab that cube sat and make sure it doesn't turn into space junk. So this is pretty great. Doesn't it kind of feel like that there is, you know, it's funny. There, there's kind of a theme here with, with, with today's show. And we've seen it with maybe, you know, the, the we were talking before, maybe the winter of some of the boom of, of, of a few years ago. Now, uh, you know, this story, which to me is exciting. And we're at the very least, we're talking about it because... Now with SpaceX and some of you know the, the the space exploration, the idea of useful space, you know, useful orbiting uh, space, seems something like that that we want to pay more attention to. We want yeah. to clean up that space a little bit more. Clean up your space. Clean up your orbit. Well, yeah, uh, and then of course we have a big changing of the guard in the headlines. Yes. Uh, what? We have a changing of the guard in the headlines. No, we uh, we're going to discuss a big philosophical changing of the guard in the headlines. after the headlines. Sorry, after now the I get it. That's the yes, right sound clip, even. Okay, so we were talking about this newsfeed, and Justin alluded to this earlier. Uh, we are seeing more and more examples of algorithmically generated things, which for a decade 
have promised to to free us from having to think, right? Pandora, just put in a song you like and it will play songs you like from here until the end of time. Search, uh, search will just automatically crawl the web and when you tell it what you want to find, it will deliver those results. Uh, and we're finding out that, well, you know what? Sometimes I would like my music curated by a human being. And so we see Beats One Radio. We see human curated stations like Soma FM finally getting the due that they deserve as people return to them. We see curated playlists on Apple Music and other services. RDO coming back with curated radio stations. And people are like excited about this, right? Because it provides an element that was missing from the algorithm. And we, we see it a lot with bad actors, right? If you're like, oh, I want to make sure that I get rid of you know, the unacceptable things that are posted on the internet showing up in search results, we need human intervention to do that. So, Justin, uh, you asked the question when we were preparing for this, are we, are we at the point where we can wield the algorithm as weapons instead of just laying back and expecting that they will just do everything for us? I think the answer is yes, and, and for two reasons. A, we have become smart enough to understand where they are good and where they aren't, and B, we have stopped thinking of them as our end-all, be-all solution. Like, we, we, have, we have understood that they are not going to just get better exponentially and eventually meet our expectations. We've all had exactly that Pandora. You know, Pandora is really a great example of this because uh, the Musical Genome Project uh, promised us, and Pandora's application of it, promised us the beautiful future of, hey, did you stop listening? For me, it was perfect. I kind of stopped listening to new music in college. So it was like, great. All you got to do is enter in all those songs that you like, those bands you liked in college, and we will give you new acts or old acts, acts from, from around the spectrum that will not have the biases that you have of, oh, that's not a band I've heard of before. We'll just feed it to you in a continuous playlist, and you will be able to enjoy that and discover new artists. And then my Decemberist radio station effectively had the same seven songs on it from when I started listening to it to when... Uh, I stopped listening to Pandora regularly because they ultimately just tracked beats per minute and certain pitches. And that was limited. It was just Billy Liar over and over again. It was, well, you know, I, I, I could just listen to Billy Liar. For, it was like Ben Queller and uh, a few other, the shins. Oh, my God, Pandora loves feeding me the shins. <laughs> uh, and, and what we have now is this idea that, like, all right, let's use the algorithm as a net to capture stuff, and then let's pick and choose. Let's let's hire. Like this is almost in a weird way. It feels like job creation, doesn't it? I, interesting. That's an interesting take because I don't think that's the motivation behind it necessarily, but it could be an effect of it, right? Facebook has been trying for almost a decade to say we've got the news feed that will show you what you want that you didn't even know. And universally, everyone I talk to who uses Facebook says, I just don't understand how the news feed decides to put this up here, right? They're always looking at some weird thing that they don't get. And it's because it's incomplete. The clues are too subtle. People like pages for the wrong reasons. It's hard to tell when you liked a page because you wanted to win a prize versus you liked a page because you liked it versus you liked it because you accidentally clicked. Uh, and and so we're we in all of these situations at search and music and Facebook newsfeed are seeing that algorithms aren't sufficient. Now here's my question for you though, Justin. Is it that the algorithm just isn't there yet and we need to keep developing at slower progress than we expected, but eventually one day we will get an algorithm that won't give you the same seven songs over and over again on Pandora. But until that day, we need human curation. Until that day, Facebook should let us do some prioritization of people to kind of patch over the gap in the algorithm. Or is there an essential element to human curation that is something of a surprise and maybe it could be mimicked by an ai someday that is people like but it's not about an algorithm it's about being able to either exert some control in the case of the facebook newsfeed or be surprised by something that you didn't know you would like because somebody played dram's cha-cha on beats one i think the difference it's the difference between google news and buzzfeed you know, and, and, and I love both I would of even them. say tech meme because tech meme does human curation. Sure, exactly. 
you know, I, I think there is something essential to the idea that the human experience is unique and that a human can understand and react to it you know, before what an algorithm can right now. You know, like, like one of the things that's been fascinating about the Apple Music playlist is that a lot of what people are reacting to are, or I see a lot in, in terms of examples, and I've listened to a lot, are producer-based playlists. So here are all the Jay-Z songs produced by Timbaland. Here are all the Snoop Dogg songs uh, produced by Pharrell. And these are elements that never really were put together, you know, that, that weren't, like, it, 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 it's a smart little genre of like oh wow no i i always these are always the big hits and that's that just a data created playlist it's just somebody recognized a different kind of data to press the sort by feature on exactly and that's where i think we're we're looking at it's like it's not like this isn't all data uh, this isn't all pulled in by algorithm right it's not like this can't all be recognized it's just understanding it, it's really the separation of good data from bad data useful data from not useful data. And that's something that right now algorithms are great at compiling. They're not necessarily great at sorting. And the human element tends to uh, tends to get over that. And, and right now, my question for you, Tom, what other services and websites would you like to see a human touch on top of the curation of, of yeah. an algorithm? You know, the first thing that pops to mind is fantasy sports, which does have this already, right? You have your you have your stats view in fantasy baseball where you can see like what players are performing by stats, and then you have your your human view, but not often enough do you combine the two. Where you say you have somebody take the stats view and go, okay, this person is leading in on base percentage, but let's be clear, or even go crazier, things like VORP, right? Yeah. But let's be clear. Uh, we know that uh, he he fades in 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 May. Uh, that's a bad example though, because it's data. You just say like, you know what? I'd be a little wary of him right now. My instinct is that this guy is a better bet. He's going to get more playing time in the future. These human type things, these human type guesses. So that's the first thing that comes to mind is fantasy sports. But the second one that comes to mind is t uh, video, watching movies and TV. I want I just desperately want Netflix to give me a curated playlist that is maybe recommended like, oh, we see that you like sci-fi stuff. Here's, you know, maybe it's Stan Lee or, or maybe it's, uh, uh, um, I, I don't know, so, some other, you know, Felicia Day. This is their curated list of great sci-fi television shows and movies. Well, let's, let's, say, let's say like Alan Seppenwall or somebody who is, who is a, a television critic uh, that has a following to say like, okay, this isn't necessarily Perfect. his job. Yeah. Uh, but you hire him, and he says, "Because like Netflix is gr is a great example, because they're almost there, right? And and they're they're almost there with like the uh, British shows with anti heroes, and you they're know? banging like, their head against the wall trying to perfect that algorithm, right? And they just the progress seems to have slowed. And and I I I almost feel like if you just even took that list and had a critic that I already know and read." Uh, say, yeah, okay, take that, take not not that, and then put his name on it, I'd be way more likely to watch those shows and watch those movies because now I kind of feel like it's not just, like I, I'm not just a slave to tropes. I'm not just a slave to British accents and people who may or may not call the cops in stories. Uh, it, it's like, no, this is good. This all matches together and, and there's more to this than just the parts. Uh, I think that's, that's a fascinating thing. Let, let me give you one. And I will be, this is an idea so brilliant, if I might say so myself, yeah, that go ahead. I will be blown away if this is not in place by the end of the year. Amazon. Curated shopping that, uh, that, that they can use. They have so much algorithmic data on your shopping habits that if they just took, you know, a, a few people that, you know, don't make them celebrities. Make them... You know, uh, organizational experts make them. Uh, you know, sports. You know, the the you know, oh, so we we've noticed that you bought a mouth guard. Uh, maybe your son's gonna play soccer. Here's a, a list of stuff that we have cut through. That's not just fifty other mouth guards and and you know a, a a shin guard or something. Maybe now it's it's everything else that somebody who has raised a a child playing soccer 
would know, yeah, well, you want well, and this. And they do and have lists this. already. They have they have the ability for other shoppers to make lists, and that's there. So it's not a, 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 a very large step to just say, hey, let's hire a few people to make some lists. In fact, I'm, I almost feel like they've tried this before. I, 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 the big key is where they put it. And, mm -hmm. and they do a lot of testing on this, and I'm sure they have. Uh, also, here's another one. Uh, and, and if uh, that Amazon idea was so brilliant it's already happened, uh, then I apologize because I definitely have uh, thought of this off the cuff, and I haven't done any research on whether or not they've done stuff. Uh, Kickstarter would be another one that I, I, I think beyond just that. But, you know, Kickstarter is a large enough place that I would like to see certain people, they, if it's just, you know, uh, for like I bought uh, these noise canceling headphone things, you know, and like I'm prone to drop 150 to 200 dollars on a on a cool gadget or something like that. And aside from social media, there's not a great way for me to just hang in Kickstarter. You know, hanging in Kickstarter and searching around is kind of a tedious process that takes a lot more time. An easier way to deep dive into that would be really rad. Yeah, no, these are great ideas. Send us your ideas as well. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, I, I like where this is going. I think, I still think that algorithms will someday get there where they will be, will, they, will, they will be much better than what they are right now. And some of what we're doing is just a band aid. But I think there's always some element, and maybe less in the Facebook news feed side of things, and maybe more in the music curation side of things or the, the Kickstarter curation, where an outside perspective will always just be handy. It'll be, it'll be something that you can't quantify because of the surprise element of it. But, like, it, this is necessary to make those algorithms better. Because it's not like the algorithms came out of thin air. Right. The algorithms I analyze the data of human patterns of behavior. So this... The next phase of algorithms, the next when they get exponentially better, it will be because we selected, you know, humans interacted with algorithms in the same way that users just uh, interacted with data, and that's how the initial algorithms, you know, got really good. All right, let's move on to our pick of the day from Comey. Uh, this was for Molly and her bathroom and the resident spider that you saved. I assume you saved her from that. No, you want to know what? This is this is a story of heartbreak. Uh, mm. Molly, I I told Molly, hey, just text me, and and I'll come over because I don't I know her address, and she didn't have my number, and uh, I, oh. an email just sat in my inbox because like you know, probably still there. Hours just passed, and, and I was like, "Oh, I guess you know, I guess she didn't need uh didn't didn't need help with the spider." So then I look at my email, and she's like, "Oh my god, I don't have your number, uh, but here's my number and here's my address." And I was like, "No!" I, I so I let I let her down. Ah, oh, that's so sad. Uh, well, she could do what Comey suggests and get the battery operated small vacuum that sucks bugs into the tube and lets you release it outside your house. Uh, products are named uh, things like Bug Buster, Bug Wand, Bug Vat. They're usually under $20. Makes it very easy to catch a bug or a spider without getting too close. Comey says, I've got a feeling this used to be on infomercials, but many of my friends didn't know about it. Uh, hence my pick of the day. So, you know, some people don't care about squashing the spider, but if you do, if you're one of those people who like, uh, I know Anthony Carboni has said this and we have concerns. I like to just take the spiders and take them outside and set them free. You can get a, a, a Bug Buster, Bug Buster vacuum. I mean, check it out. You are, you're, you're traumatizing the spider. You know, well, the spider's not going to be happy being vacuumed up into a tube and set outside. I'm not going to deny that, Justin. You know, you mean you're gonna now you're gonna have to pay for spider therapy because you know yeah. it's going to be so so terrified. <laughs> Make sure that you give the spider your email address and your text message phone number. Especially, um, also, you got to you got to watch out because it's a one two that splits into two one damage minions. <laughs> that's a good point <laughs> and your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks unless you silence it before you suck it up it's a, it's uh, a tricky uh, we've, we've got a uh, message of the day we got several messages of the day a bunch of good messages of the day we're going to start with someone who gave us a call on our phone line uh, saying uh, he had some feelings about Windows 10 as a Windows insider Hi, Mr. Merritt. Uh, listening to show 2528 and the um, very clear uh, outline of who will get Windows 10 when and your comments regarding the uh, insider preview people being breathless, fanboys, anxiously awaiting and 
feeling terribly disappointed if they don't get it. Um, I've actually been on the Insider Pack for six months or so across four or five different devices. And to be honest with you, I'm not really going to care that much whether I get the final bits on that date or not because I've seen the progression. I've seen the narrowing of the changes. And I don't think the final bits are going to be all that different than the last bill they push out to the pass rate. Um, so love the show. Thanks for all the information. Love to hear myself every now and again on it in the back end. But uh, take care and uh, good luck. Thanks. Bye. So there you go. I, I think what I was trying to say is that they're making sure that the Windows insiders get it because they're more likely to have the fans of Windows who are very excited in that group. They are less likely to disappoint people. Uh, but he's very, is it very good for him to point out like, hey, just because you're inside the, the insider program doesn't mean you immediate, you, you're guaranteed to love Windows 10. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think and this is another kind of uniquely Microsoft issue, right? That like people... Rely on Microsoft. They like Microsoft, and yet, uh, it's it's the user install base is so large that passion isn't necessarily, you know, it, it, like it is it is a long-standing old marriage, right? You know, it's it's you know it's there. They like it, you know, but maybe they're not they're not going to run up and down screaming about it. Dr. Kermudgeon, who's one of our bosses, said, I quite enjoyed your after show discussion about the Amazon Echo Wednesday. Uh, in fact, Jenny Josephson was talking about her dealings with Alexa. And uh, if you go check out the latest episode of Tell It Anyway, tellitanyway.com, she and her husband interview the Amazon Echo. Uh, Dr. Kermudgeon says, apparently... My Echo liked it too. You triggered her about a dozen times, although she never responded, probably because she didn't think you were saying anything important. And that's probably true. When Amazon first announced the Echo, it was universally derided in the tech press as being pointless and creepy, but I got an early unit and loved it, and have felt some satisfaction to see that same tech press come around and discovering that not only is it a useful device, but it's actually pretty useful itself. So thanks for joining the horde who can't imagine for the horde that it could be useful until you have one. Consider this future non-Apple product announcements. Whoa, non-Apple product announcements, Dr. Curmudgeon. What are you trying to say? Uh, how, are, are you tempted now, Justin, to buy an Amazon Echo? I, I like, I use Alexa for shopping. She's great. Was it universally derided? Uh, you know, I don't think so. I think because Dr. Curmudgeon is a curmudgeon, uh, is exaggerating that there were some people who were derided though. Side eye, them. certainly. Yeah. You know, I think it, there was there was skepticism, but uh, you can't deny the fact that it sold out as fast as it did. Yeah. Um, people that I know that have it actually almost universally really like it. The in fact the only reason why I would not necessarily uh, uh, go with one is is more because of the layout the the confined space of our apartment where there's a lot of public speaking happening uh, a, a lot of the day that, you know, would trigger something in, in the, you know, if, you know, between all the content that Ashley and I create and stuff like that, you know, to have something reacting in an always on kind of way just in our small little footprint might become uh, a little annoying. But uh, I, I think, I think it's a great idea. And I think the idea of an always on AI is, is, is really fun and smart. And uh, every interaction I've had with one has been great. So. Uh, Rusty wrote in and said, being a DTNS co-executive producer is the best job I've ever had. Uh, thank you, Rusty. Also says, I really hope we don't spend a bunch of money to change our roadways just to accommodate self-driving cars. I predict we'll put beacons on human-driven cars. Non-automated cars or self-driving cars can operate in human-driven mode to tag them so that self-driving cars can appropriately factor the behavior into their calculations. Here's my question. If different self-driving car manufacturers have unique driving algorithms, will they need to share their code with each other so that they can program expected behavior? Oh, wait, the car makers could avoid that issue and just open source all the code and work together to accelerate our robot car future, but they probably won't. Well, that seems to me more likely than... I think we might think of it in terms of like a very mature auto market. You know, uh, I think there's you know the, the the smaller the pie, the sharper the knives, as I think the the Henry Kissinger quote uh, has it. If there is a big wide open future, and everybody, you know, if every car company can immediately get into a new vertical and force people to buy new cars, 
which by the way is kind of their business uh, and and something that would make that easier uh, or expedite law changes which is really what their problem are right now is by sharing some element of open source predictive code I could see that happening a lot more because the profit motive is on the right side for the car companies as opposed to guarding every little inch of it. And there's a couple of projects already. Uh, I did a search around the Elcano project at E-L-C-A-N-O project.org uh, is an open source autonomy project for self-driving cars. So Rusty, get on in there and help maybe uh, if, you've got, if you've got the inclination or the skills to do so. Uh, there's also a Robot Car UK from Oxford University uh, that has some open source code around it. So the beginnings are there for what Rusty's talking about. It's not impossible. Uh, it's just a matter of getting everybody on board like Justin says. Also, I hope we don't spend a bunch of money changing roadways. I was thinking, and as I explained yesterday, just putting like those temporary concrete dividers the way you do for, for high occupancy lanes is all that would really be necessary uh, if you wanted to temporarily make lanes for self-driving cars. And I'm um, sure it would, it would uh, be done very fast and definitely not happen during rush hour traffic or, or in Well, in Florida it would be. Uh, in California, I don't know. That's you know, they, they don't have as much experience out here. <laughs> uh, and, and then the beacons on human driving cars is interesting, although ideally they aren't necessary. The idea of self-driving cars is not that they have to know what's in the other car to be able to react to it. The idea is that they'll react to whatever the car other car is doing. So it does, shouldn't matter, ideally, whether the other car is driven by a human or another self-driving car. They, they can react to situations that are fluid, including things like pedestrians and bicyclists, which are even less predictable than other cars. So I, I don't know that you'd have to do the beacon thing, but it is an interesting thought. Yeah, and, and in general, with, with self-driving cars, they're only going to, like, whenever we get into these conversations, I kind of feel like we're putting the cart before the horse, because the, the self-driving cars are going to need at, like... There's no horse or driver. There's no, well, number one, yes. This is just a metaphor, which uh, I don't know if they will be allowed in our self-driving car future, but uh, we... You're always going to need to, to do, like, very complicated stop sign kind of driving for self-driving cars. You know, like, the idea that we'll be able to go faster on the highway is only a problem we can get to when the, these cars, when the technology is so sophisticated that you're able to just drive around your neighborhood and go to Arby's and come back, which is a... And they can do that. I mean, they, they, they have demonstrated that they can do that. The issue is in the mapping into getting them to be able to recognize all the areas. It takes... A, it, that, that, from what I've read, is one of the hurdles is how hard it is to get an area prepped for the car to be able to do it. But once it's prepped... They actually have they have really good success in being able to go to Arby's, particularly. I don't know. I mean, listen, they got that new BLT. Uh, right. It'll be also a question on, on legality, on, on when uh, you know everything's yeah. all street legal, as they say. Yeah, the safety record is going to have to be even better than 100%, frankly. Like, yeah. it's, it's going to have to be insane for people to be comfortable with this yet. Uh, Yaru in sunny Malaysia wrote in and pointed out that Nokia as a company was already doing badly before they started their alliance with Microsoft. Uh, and we kind of mentioned this, but he's making the point even better. Uh, he says, look, Microsoft alliance with Nokia have them a much needed or gave them a much needed financial lifeline as they try to figure out the smartphone business. Perhaps they could have lasted a little longer if Microsoft didn't buy them, but I don't think the ultimate fate of the town would have changed by much. I think this is another good example of a business being disrupted while not being able to respond to new paradigms. And it's a fair point. Uh, you know, we were, we were pointing out the downside of Microsoft's layoffs and, and how they don't seem to have really improved or saved Nokia at all by, by, buying it uh but the fact is maybe nobody could have right it may not have mattered yeah it it you know it, it just shows uh you know how uh how, how long you know for, for people watching this story it's it's lightning crashes things come things go you know uh you know c goes in c goes out how are you gonna explain that yeah it's the moon actually that's <laughs> causes that <laughs> ah, but we'll leave that for Jonathan Strickland and how stuff works. This is Daily Tech News Show, and Justin Robert Young, thank you for being on. I love it. 
Uh, man, uh, I'll tell you what. I feel like this was a particularly diverse reference episode. I feel like I, I want everybody <laughs> to go on my Twitter feed and just tell me all the references. Uh, <laughs> Please make know, a just, citation list. Just make a citation list because I feel like we left plenty of Easter eggs. Uh, thank you so much. This is uh, uh, always always a pleasure to come on. Twitter.com slash Justin R. Young uh, to follow Justin's exploits. He's got all kinds of podcasts, all kinds of projects, a wedding podcast and a wedding at the end coming up later yeah. this uh, in, in, in a month or so. Oh, man. Uh, believe you me. It is uh, like, like, like the T-Rex in the original Jurassic Park. It is an object uh, that is closer than it might appear, even as terrifying as it is. Uh, also, Twitter.com slash Contender Game is the social media headquarters for the brand new card game that I'm coming out uh, with at the beginning of August, uh, working alongside the extraordinarily talented John Teasdale and Guts and Glory uh, design firm. So if you are interested in that, we are probably going to do another run of, uh, of, of uh, beta test print and plays. We sent out a bunch of them over the July 4th weekend. So uh, if you are interested... Uh, in in uh, in in, in uh, playtesting, or you just want to follow to see more information on it, go ahead on over twitter.com slash contender game. It's also contender game on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you to all of our bosses, all the patrons who support the show, whether it's on Patreon, PayPal, dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. Uh, you guys are what make us able to get better. So if you enjoy the show, if you get some value out of the show, all we say is, you know, maybe give us a dollar at least if it's worth that to you a month. Patreon.com slash Ace Detect or DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support if you can. Uh, also, we have a new DTNS t-shirt. It was designed by Jenny and perfected by Seb Gunn's Polish. And uh, it is available at the store, dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. And if you're going to Nerdtacular in Salt Lake City later this month, you can actually use the code two sides so you don't have to pay for shipping. You just pick it up at Nerdtacular. It's a special Nerdtacular version of the DTNS shirt. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. Listen to the show live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern at alphageekradio.com and visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. We'll be back tomorrow with Darren Kitchen and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> and for the second time... <laughs> That was a good show. What should we call it? Uh, I have many good votes, but I want to put in a bid now to have Justin explain the card game because I'm a huge political junkie matched and exceeded only by my husband. Okay, so uh, I like to cha-cha. <laughs> in a Latin bar, yeah. Uh, honey, I Shrunk the Chips. Nice. Uh, I vote for Pumoji, which mm. is actually a Pumoji. Um, <laughs> the uh, Diamond Club hopes you've enjoyed this program. Oh no! Come on. Uh, office Diamond <laughs> Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. Uh, Tom, you hit it again. <laughs> ah, sorry about that. <laughs> office pushes keys for command control. Okay. Um, Microsoft. This is also the 14-year anniversary phone. of the British show The Office. Oh, hmm. the OG Office. There's a Doctor Who office mashup out there that I haven't gotten a chance to look at. I saw a link to it, though. Slack gets emotional. <laughs> I get so emotional. Discussion section stuff. Uh, Showbot.tv. Go Load and cast your vote. We don't guarantee the one with the most votes uh, gets chosen. Jenny, do you want to do you want to see this card here? I do. I really do. But your vote definitely sways our opinion on things. So that's uh, some of the art. Okay. So how does it work? Explain it to me in a nutshell. All right. Here, I'll I'll I'll, I'll show you. All right. Two types of cards. You got your moderator card. Mm-hmm. And your action card. Mm-hmm. Moderator, let's say with the f uh, four of us were playing, and I was the moderator. Uh, you read a debate style, a, a Gwen Eiffel uh, style uh, question about uh, mm -hmm. democracy, so that the topic would be democracy. 
And at that point, you uh, everybody has a hand of five action cards that have things like, uh, look at smarty pants over here. <laughs> uh, you had your chance. At what cost? Can we please stick to the issues? <laughs> and then some of them that have blanks, which you would fill in with democracy. So some may call democracy a problem. I call it a solution. Right. Um, you uh, you basically just have to play three cards in a round. It goes one by one, and you can play all three of them at once. If you can string uh, a, a big sentence together, you can go uh, one oh. by one. You can do a two a two and one combo on either side of it. But as soon as you play three, you're out for the round. So if you play three up top, then you're not going to get the last word. The moderator selects who made the best argument, and you move on. Oh my gosh, Matt Flanagan's going to go insane. He is like he treats the election like a spectator sport. Uh, I would get along with him very well. <laughs> there's, uh, that it, it is my favorite thing in the world. So uh, you will have a chance to meet him in several weeks. Oh, I can't wait to rad, share. Awesome. I can't wait to share my waiting for the election results of Gore Bush 2000 with him after hearing I him know, talk about it. I know. I know. He has the defining Gore v. Bush story and I've, I've, I can't believe I'm so excited to collect more. Uh, my science teacher uh, counted hanging chads. Oh. Really? Well, because it all happened in South Florida where I was in high school. I was growing up. <sighs> That's amazing. Yeah, it, Matt told this epic story of what happened to him that night uh, as it pertains to a girl. And it's, it's one of our classic it's such Matt a good story. and Jenny's stories. It's just it's classic. Um, so uh, so that's exciting. Oh my gosh, you two will get along famously. Um, but yeah, count us in for any game playing with cards uh, that are uh, well, politics. Actually, uh, just uh, send me your address because what I've been okay. what, what, what's been really easy to do um, is uh, is just uh, print out on demand um, mm -hmm. at a FedEx. Uh, 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 the the hundred card print or the hundred card beta deck, okay. uh, and so that way you can kind of get a, a test of it. It's actually the feedback has been fantastic on it so far. Yeah. Oh yeah, do I need to do something to get that deck? Mm, so I can either send you the PDF or if you want to send me your address, I can get it printed at. Uh, okay, Facebook. I was supposed to send you my address, I guess. Uh, but you can send me the PDF. I can get it printed. Cool. All right, then I'll just send you the PDF. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, by and large, the biggest feedback is not enough cards, which is great because that's a good is, problem. Yeah, that means like people are enjoying card. it. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's kind of what we decided. Like, it would be a win if everybody was like, "There's you need more cards," because the, the the base deck is going to be three times as large. So uh, that was something we were planning for, and it'll be larger depending on whether or not we can hit our KS goals. Oh, is there a KS? Yeah, there's gonna we're we're doing uh, a. I mean, because it really, it only felt right to have a campaign for the yes. political card game. Absolutely. Right? right? That makes sense. Also, it's a thing, right? Unlike a podcast, which is kind of an unending thing. Like, the Kickstarter for a card a game thing, seems, yeah. seems to make sense. Like, and, we are Kickstarting to produce this thing that you will get at the end of the Kickstarter. Yeah. And so we're actually, we're shooting the, uh, we're shooting the video this Saturday. And, um... And then, yeah, we'll launch at the awesome. beginning. So if people want to track it, should they just follow you on Twitter for now? Is that the best way? Contender to... game. Contender game on... Just on, keep track uh, of contender game. Yeah, on, on Twitter. That's where we're trying to direct all of it. And I know all that right. I mean, I'm, I'm always going to be a hub for, well, for the news of it. But... You know what you should do? If you really want to just make it explode through the stratosphere, just send it to all the kids on the bus. If, of every campaign, do you know that phrase, the kids on the? Oh board? yeah, no, no, no. Believe you me, we yeah. are. Uh, we 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 have a, we have a couple of really fun ideas. We yeah. definitely want to. We want to send a copy, a full deck, to every presidential candidate with yep. the uh, with the note that they have to give it back when they're no longer a candidate. <laughs> uh, so we'll we'll include a return uh, envelope um, because once you're no longer a contender, you got to buy one. 
Um, <laughs> the kids on the the kids on the bus in particular are your key, which is those reporters who the digital yeah. journalists whose job it is to follow these candidates through the slog of the early campaign. Those are your that's your audience in addition to your obvious audience. They need well, you. They need you. <laughs> they drink what, a what, lot. What we would also like to do is uh, we would like to barnstorm with the debates. Oh, oh my um, God. So we could we could maybe play with with the kids on the bus. I feel like that would be that, that would be amazing. You know, I right? I actually I oh, yeah. bet we could we should that talk online. We're about to have a meeting, so I'm actually going to hold my thought so okay. I don't Good. say it live. But I have a I can't believe I can't believe that. I haven't talked about this on on DTNS yet. That's I mean no. You've mentioned the card game a couple of times, but you really haven't gone into. I, we just don't have time to go into as much depth. Yeah, I think also it's like when you do. 50,000 podcasts like you, you talk about it 49,000 times and you're like well I've talked about it as much as anybody wants to hear me talk about it and you forget that there's some place you hadn't talked about it so yeah there we go I can taste caramel in my mouth right now by the way because I'm going to go to B-Sweet oh my god I'm so jealous it makes me want to come over there and I'm have sorry a to bring it up again if I wasn't I'm just already so excited. going to the dentist B-Sweet is a, is a bakery in the you're going Sawtelle. to B-Sweet I'm going to remove sweets. Yeah, <laughs> kind of go remove the effects of sweets. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to get a super sexy mouth guard. Nice. Yeah. No. Do they wanted. have different no models that you can choose from? I mean, there is one. That someone sent me in chat yesterday one that has like gold teeth. Uh, uh, yeah, like DRAM. That sounds just like a brilliant idea. <laughs> so excited for that. Please do that. Please, please do that. <laughs> oh, man. J. Joe in the house. And then, you know what else is exciting? We're doing our first... I can even show you a little bit. We're doing our first uh, incubated podcast here tonight. Yeah, Jenny's starting a podcast incubator, Justin. Uh, I'm going to oh, wear a what? kimono. <laughs> uh, well, I have an office. So it's funny. I have this office um, here in sort of central Los Angeles. And as it turns out, it's a reasonably decent place to do a like a three to four to five person podcast. And now that I've got all the gear, um, friends of mine who hear these various podcasts are coming out of the woodwork and really having their own excellent ideas. And so we're uh, we're we're doing a pilot tonight. It's really exciting. I didn't That's realize great. what yeah I didn't realize what having an office would do in terms of being able to bring people to a place to do a show. It brings Man, people now, together. Now you want, I don't know. A while ago, Veronica and I talked about getting getting office mm -hmm. space. I think maybe I'll, that would... Let know. me just say, let me just say, uh, in, vo in favor of office space, I mean, it's more difficult for you guys where you are, uh, obviously, but um, in terms of office space, it creates all these weird opportunities that you wouldn't ever think of if you didn't have an office. Yeah. Like like uh, buying rubber bands. Yeah, and shooting at the person at the other desk. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this one right here. This one is look. It's a, I'll, I'll do a little tour. It's 175 square feet. It's nothing. Yeah. It's just a rectangle. Yeah. But you could really make something of it if you if you were committed. I mean, right now that's my friend's desk, who's an editor. But if you were committed to yeah. like making it a podcast space, it really would not be that hard to get good sound out of a rectangle, you know? Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, you just throw up a little, 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 little baffling, yep. you know? Baffle it up. Good mics, go. Good sound out of a rectangle is my AHA cover band. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. Sorry. I, I I I only didn't say anything because I had something terrible to say and and it wouldn't. Be bad. <laughs> uh, that's a triangle. That's what, no, no. Well, I'm just gonna text the two of you and. and <laughs> I did this on the morning stream too, where I had a terrible, an awful joke, and I I just sent it to Scott and Brian, and we laughed. It was just terrible radio. At least this is better because it's in the after show. But I used to have to do that in person. It's seen it. I'd be like, I just thought of the worst possible thing to say. Here, I'm just going to write it down so that you don't get the full impact of me saying it out loud. 
Can't wait. Jenny, which one of us is going to read it out loud? Wait, read what? Sorry, I was responding to 8,000 things in the, in the chat room that I didn't see. What are we reading out loud? The horrible thing that Justin is texting us. Oh, ooh, exciting. Let me find my phone. I have to empty my trash before I can get your, your text, Justin. My starter well, it's disc all, it's is almost full. <laughs> Don't read it out loud. Don't. Good sound out of a box. No, no, don't do it. Oh, oh no! <laughs> it's pretty good. That's pretty good. It's actually very accurate. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Put it in the chat room. Put it in the chat room. <laughs> it's, I don't want my name. Oh, on that. my asthma. Uh, well, so I guess we're done here. I'm out yeah. of the post. Uh, we're done. Thanks, kids, for watching. <laughs> Great show, everybody. Uh, oh, I don't think I mentioned it. I mentioned it in the chat room, but Honey, I Shrunk the Chips uh, is the title. And, hey, look uh, at that. Yeah. So uh, what's, coming up? what's coming up later today on the Diamond Clubs and Alpha Geek Radio? Uh, I know uh, Neshcom is, is going to stream. Um, I don't know if, if, uh, if anything's on Thursdays. Regularly, uh, the Jizz Whiz, the Giz Whiz, Giz, giz. <laughs> giz, giz. <laughs> and oh, out. Jeez. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yes, that's right. The Giz Whiz, uh, uh, with Dick Bartolo. Did you get back from uh, back from London, England? Oh, I don't know. Good question. Wait, and I, I had there's an actual thing that helps you know the answer to this, which is what I do all the time. Oh, which is next, right? Uh, exclamation point next in the IRC yeah. schedule. Yeah. For schedule. Yeah. Jizz whiz and then us it's again. Jizz whiz. I mean, come on. Please. Oh, shit. I don't know. Hard G, soft G, they're all the same to me. <laughs> oh, it's just very specifically when you make that a J <laughs> and not a G, it's just a whole different word. It's all coming up after this Annie Lennox tribute concert. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.